Alrighty, we are live and we have Neil Myers in the gallery. Hi there, everybody. Hello there, Neil, with his work here. And we have some questions for Neil. Here goes his work. And uh, so it says, your art obviously bears the marks of an intriguing mind. Can you tell us a <laughs> bit about your life and background and how you came to like art? Well, uh, my, my mom painted and still paints and draws uh, a little bit as well these days, but some of my first and earliest inspirations were paintings that my mom did. And still to this day in my studio in Tucson, I have a painting of Van Gogh, a copy she did of Van Gogh's irises, which is really, really beautiful. And I walk by it every day on my way to work. And um, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. We didn't really have a lot of artists to look at or a lot of uh, sort of contemporary painters to look at. So I kind of looked at my mom's work and then I kind of fell in love with art and books, especially like the work of Van Gogh and the Impressionists. So yeah, that's really how it began. Your work is highly individualized. We've heard you called a neo fauvist We see some Vincent Van Gogh influence in some of your European pieces too. What inspired you to be so different? Ha! Uh, well, if, if I'm different at all, maybe it uh, deserves a different answer. Uh, I've said to people sometimes that I think all art is just kind of a confirmation of your instincts, in a way. Um, the really great part about what I do is I love thick paint, I love bright color, I love this landscape, like the big cacti and the wildness of it. Um, in a weird way, I even love the heat, because it almost like creates a lighting situation that, that creates contrast and things like that. Um, I, I have to say, in a way, I was conscious almost of the need to be different, in a way, though it's not really a pose, it's not a stretch, and it's not difficult for me. Um, I, I kind of always, um, my old French professor used to tell us a quote, I have no idea who it comes from, but he said, le style est l'homme, the style is the man. And having some sense of style and like the need to make the work look different, so you know like a good example is some years ago, uh, I forgot to sign a painting um, mm. at a gallery. Someone bought it, and then they only realized as they're about to carry it out the door that I didn't sign it. So the guy calls me and says, Neil, you need to sign your painting. And we laughed about it because uh, there was no mistaking who did it. <laughs> nice. And even he said that. He said no one uh, would confuse who did it, and not even the people who bought it, uh, but signing it was just a formality. So the truth is I like these things. I don't have to struggle to do them at all. Um, I kind of took the inspiration of Vincent van Gogh, the Impressionist, and later Jean-Claude Kilisi, mm -hmm. my mentor and very good friend. And uh, I took those things and just threw it all at this landscape and, and at this sort of uh, the Southwestern environment generally. And so, um, I'm conscious of the need to be different, but it's not really hard work because I actually do what I love and I, it's not much of a stretch for me really. Yeah. Lovely. Why so much blue? Where does it come from? Ah. What does it mean? How is it supposed to make the viewer feel? Well, you know, I, I once told a guy one time, uh, sometimes the answer to questions like that are a certain aesthetic, you know, sometimes they could be answered in a, in a long article about art aesthetics and sometimes, sometimes not. And the truth is, um, the truth is actually, I like it. I know that that may sound uh, <laughs> almost inane, you know. I, I like the effects that I discovered when I juxtapose multiple different blues on top of each other. And uh, by the way, this is a painting that's probably about 80 to 85% finished. Uh, it may be close to being finished after we're done tonight. But this kind of gives you an idea of uh, almost like what one of my works look like looks like right before the finishing stage. And uh, the truth is, I I like the effect of the blues. I I feel something really. Um, am I saying borderline spiritual almost in the blues that we feel between the sky and even the ocean? Though we don't have one <laughs> right around our neighborhood, I never miss a chance to to go visit one if I can. And um, the blues are just an extension of what to me was natural instinct. Uh, and also there's almost an infinity of combinations. One of, my, one of my specialties is to find different blues. And every time, for example, when I order tubes, I try to order a blue that I've never used before. I've actually been asked multiple times about the Oregon blue, 
It's uh, variously pronounced like Yilman blue. It's difficult to say. This was the first new blue discovered, I believe, in 200 years. And it was discovered by researchers, uh, I think, doing superconductor work. And it's created a very dense blue, which is a little similar to cobalt and a little similar to ultramarine. Mm -hmm. And this was the one tube I managed to score. And an artist friend of mine got all the rest of them. Nice. <laughs> so we'll have to call him. But the truth is, the blues are just kind of part of my natural instinct. Um, it's something I don't really, art I don't use the same amount of blue in every artwork. Um, but I enjoy... Um, a good example, this is getting into little aesthetic details maybe. Mm -hmm. I might, for example, uh, do a first layer of blue, say blue shadows in ultramarine. Mm -hmm. It's a common one I use, it's almost like a background. And then I may go over and highlight it in phthalo blue, or cerulean blue, or Sevres blue. Mm -hmm. And literally that just depends on how I feel at the moment. So I found that by juxtaposing pure blues on top of each other, you get a lot of really neat effects, little small things, and even like the unusual blues, just putting little touches of them in there. Mm -hmm. And it almost uh, makes your eye move across a piece. And uh, truthfully, I just like the effect of it. And the work sells really well, so I certainly can't complain about that. <laughs> awesome. It works. Can you tell us in, uh, in maybe which of these paintings you use this, uh, this blue? Uh, in the orchard piece over there, there were some highlights uh, used in that, uh, with that blue. Little touches and dots and places and so forth. And to my recollection that there were a few little touches also in this big still life right here. This is actually, um, you want to talk about strange stories. Mm -hmm. I had a dream about white irises against an orange background. And I almost felt the need like I need to get up and do something about it. But when I woke up the next morning, I remembered the dream. I remembered some kind of curious effect about that white against that orange. And um, I put together a composition that was almost, uh, it wasn't the precise rendering of a dream, but it's where I got the idea. Very interesting. We should listen to our dreams, I guess. <laughs> That's interesting too, because yeah. this work uh, looks like it's a little departed from uh, maybe previous works, especially with the sure. the orange, the background of the orange. Sure. That's interesting sure. that that came to you in a dream. Sometimes, I, I, I think uh, some of us artists are a little scared to use the loudest and wildest colors mm. as a primary color, like to fill in a background or mm. to cover a large space. And uh, sometimes that's just a matter of courage. Um, mm. It's only a canvas, and yeah, I always say to young painters, you don't have to show it to anybody if it doesn't work. <laughs> so, yeah. But the truth is, I like I like things like that. I like paintings that are bordering on vibrant to nearly loud, coloristically. Um, you know, best way I can explain it, perhaps. Beautiful. Thank you. So it's, uh, you live and work in Arizona. What attracted you to this blazing hot state, and why do its landscapes and cacti feature in so much of your work? Um, also, too, a bit of a question of natural instinct. Uh, we moved here in 2003. And the best way I can describe it is, is kind of all the things leading up to my life before that I had, we, pre for the previous four years, had actually lived in New Zealand, in Auckland, New Zealand. Mm. And I had begun to paint in earnest in the last couple of years I was in New Zealand. So I was almost primed for something that mm. was ready to happen. And then, we, and then when we moved back to, to the States, uh, we ended up here in the Southwest and then in Tucson. And uh, I, I think the best way to say it is I was kind of primed for it. I was ready for it. A lot of what I had sort of absorbed about color from Fauvist, from the Impressionist, from Jean-Claude Kilisi, from Vincent Van Gogh. Um, I literally know Van Gogh works backwards and forwards. Um, all those things were just building up to that point. And so in 2003, when we moved here, um, what did Jim Morrison say one time about the doors? He said it was like it was like a an, a, an arrow, a, a bow being pulled back for twenty some years, and boom, all of a sudden being let loose. And uh, it was something of the same feeling for me when I came to this region. So, um, a lot of my my loves and my instincts about color and getting myself back into painting. Um, a lot of it was sort of just a preparatory thing. That when I saw this landscape, I saw like the big cacti. It was very different than the North Island of New Zealand or the East Coast, Western North Carolina, where I grew up. 
it was so different, but it was just screaming to me like, okay, this is it. This is where you do it. The bow, it's been let loose. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't something I needed to, uh, to expound on at the time, but I knew it. I knew it immediately when we got here. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I began to do some works based on this environment and literally almost by accident got into a gallery in Tucson and started selling work immediately. And I couldn't believe kind of how well it did. It took off before I was ready for it to. And then magazines and then other, other cool things happened after that. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so for my last question, I'm curious, as an artist, what are you curious about? What keeps you curious? Hmm, well, I'm primarily, obviously, a landscape painter. A few still lives and um, other you know, floral pieces and a, a few things like that aside. I love, my wife and I, our family, we're very attached to travel. And so if you love landscape, if you love the wild world, the earth, and all the things you see as you go about it, you need to travel. You really should travel, even if it's traveling nearby. Because there are new scenes, new things, new places, new trails, new mountains, new plants, even new animals to a certain extent. And, um, but I will have to confess, I, I have one abiding passion that I don't really tell um, my art crowd about. I love, I love anything to do with space. Mm -hmm. I follow any time a probe or a vehicle lands on another moon, another planet, because I've always told people the most exotic landscapes are on other planets and other mm -hmm. moons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost, uh, if I had an extra life to live, I would create another body of work based on other planetary mm -hmm. bodies. Um, I, I, I'm one of those people, I'm the first guy who tunes in when a new rover lands on Mars. I check all the photographs mm -hmm. and I love the sensation of looking at exotic landscapes, most especially the ones that are not even on this planet. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful and precious and very unique place, this planet where we live. And of course, everyone should do all they can to preserve it because you know that beauty is something in our DNA that we need. And I, of course, naturally find lots of inspiration in our environment and in the natural world that we have here on this planet. But I have always had a great fascination with the exotic landscapes that may not even be in this world. And uh, maybe that's a new group of paintings for the future. Mm -hmm. We shall see. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Thank Appreciate you. it. And that, that's all we got today. Thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Thank you.